I remember when I was learning to drive, I felt a little bit similar like how, how I'm feeling right now. Excitement and a bit of overwhelm and anxiety. I sat in the car and the instructor told me, this is where you put the key, and this is what you do with your feet, and this is what you do with your hands, and drive. And it was a dream of mine to learn to drive. I wanted to experience that freedom. But when I realized what it actually took to drive, I really didn't feel well. I realized the, the responsibility of thinking of so many things, listening to the engine, coordinating my hands and my, my feet, and uh, looking at the traffic signs, and, and all these people that were moving on the street. I just wanted to tell everybody just to stop. But no, they didn't. The only person who could stop was me. And eventually I learned how to do that. I learned when to speed and when to stop. And I was liking the driving more and more. So after I got my license and then continued to drive on my own, I realized the next phase. I had to tell my friends or whoever was in the car not to talk not to play any music, not to listen to the radio, because again, it was too much. All I could do was really focus on the road, and I needed to know that this person by my side was with me in that moment. It, that was 30 years ago. I love driving. I've been driving a lot. And I realized that something changed. I sit in the car now, I don't really even think how I'm switching the engine on, and I'm moving from A to B, not paying attention to pretty much anything that happens outside of the, road, of the car, but I pay more attention to what people are telling me while they're in the car, and also which music I'm listening to. Through my practice of mindfulness, and also reading about the research that was done in neuroscience, I learned that actually this is exactly what our brains do. Once when we master a skill, we go on autopilot. And in that autopilot mode, our mind starts to wander. So I also learned through the practice that the way it wanders it is that it goes into two possible directions. And one is the narrative. It's Basically, the one, uh, for example, I will share right now, I really don't know what is happening behind me, and I have to see, right, yes, it is there, but there is this narrative going and saying, what if the video is not going on, what if the next slide is not on, which creates some additional anxiety. So this kind of narrative is constantly present. It keeps bringing us the insights from the history, about the past, and also talks to us about the future and it contains all the meaning that we give to experience that we have. Now, this type of thinking is, is really beneficial for visualizing, it's good for goal setting, and also for strategizing, so we want this kind of thinking. It helps us not to make same mistakes over and over again. And then there is this other road, where our mind can go on the direct experience, and that is when we connect with our senses and know what is it that I'm experiencing right here and right now. Now, I'm going to ask you to join me for an experiment, because I would like to, for you to consider that actually the next thing I learned about brain is that it doesn't know which experience is fake and which experience is real. So, let's imagine we have a lemon. Okay? You have a lemon. And you're holding a lemon in your hand and notice the color and perhaps you can already even feel the smell of lemon. And then imagine that you're cutting it and some few drops of lemon fall on your hand, right? And you're just ready to squeeze this juice into a glass as you're getting ready to make the lemonade. So what do you no notice happens with your body right now? Does anybody have more saliva in their yeah. mouth? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yes? Okay, great. So you actually had a direct experience of the narrative. But you know there is no lemon. 
You just made your body believe that there is a lemon and it went into reaction. So this is what happens when we start creating a direct experience of the narrative. Now, everything is good if there are no problems. But like any, anything else in life, you know, like it can happen that this narrative can bring some thoughts that are related to anxiety. In mindfulness, we call these thoughts a monkey mind. It's when the thoughts start coming in and it's not based on anything that is real, but more based on the fear that things will happen because in the past things did happen. I did a bit of research before this talk and I realized that 450 million of people suffer from depression, according to WHO statistics. And I also learned that the way men go through this experience is different to women or teenagers. And the way men respond to depression is that they become more irritable and uh, angry. And women have a sense uh, of uh, low self-esteem and they also um, have a sense of worthlessness. While teenagers will have a high level of anxiety, they can start using, uh, doing substance abuse, and also what happens is that um, their grades drop. So the way we respond to depression is different, and why am I mentioning it right here? Because a lot of depression is related to the monkey mind telling us that things are not going well and bad things will happen. I started to learn mindfulness because I suffered from depression some 10 years ago. And the reality of those thoughts was outstanding. But what I learned there is that there is another kind of thinking pattern or another kind of mind that befriending that kind of mind was actually really powerful. And that kind of mind is called beginner's mind. It's the mind that has a lot of curiosity about what happens right here and right now. And when curiosity um, comes up in our body, it actually helps our brain to produce a chemical, serotonin, and this helps us to learn. Now, I also want to, for people to understand, there's something very interesting that happened through the research of University of British Columbia. They followed 400 students and measured their level of cortisol, a stress hormone. And they realized that their level of cortisol in the blood correlated to the burnout of the teacher whose classes they were attending. So, the research is basically saying, is stress contagious? And again, according to the practice of mindfulness and from neuroscience, knowing that with mirror neurons we actually connect with each other, most likely that could be actually what is happening as well. That some of these stresses are not our own. It's because we are sensing and feeling each other. So coming back to curiosity, why is curiosity important? If we have a curiosity about something that is happening right now, our mind produces, or our brain produces serotonin, which is helpful for us to learn and retain the information. Very helpful in classrooms. And often we go into curiosity because new things are happening. So we want to see, go to new places, we want to see uh, new um, movies or read new books. Everything needs to be new taste the new food, so that we can have that curiosity. But in mindfulness, actually what I learned is that it's really important for us to connect with the mundane things with curiosity. Something that happens every single day. Something that started to happen to you from the moment you came to this life. Can you be curious about that? Something that you started from the day you were born and something that is going to be the very last thing that you're going to do before you leave this world. Your breath. If you learn to be curious about your breath, you will have 
abundant resource of serotonin all the time. So let's become curious about our breath. And I invite you first just to sense your own body and presence and notice perhaps your monkey mind is still going and wandering here and there and then bring attention slowly into your nose. You can even bring a bit of a giggle into that. How does it feel to rest your attention on the very tip of your nose? And then not notice which nostril is more open right now. How does your breath enter the body? Is it through your left or your right nostril? There will be slight difference for most of us. So, as you're exploring this and experiencing and being curious, I would just like to see a show of hands for those who are breathing with their left nostril more today. All right. And the right nostril. Okay, great. And if you have both, okay, excellent. It doesn't mean it has to be. And those who didn't really raise their hand, you know, it's just breathe, connect with your breath, go into the physical sensation of the breath. It's important. Feel how it goes in and your chest rises and then it flattens down as your breath leaves your body. And you will be doing it now, in a minute, while you sleep, through your whole life, curious. And I'm sensing the shift maybe of the energy in the room as we are connecting with our breath, maybe everything is a bit calmer and my voice is a bit calmer. I feel it helps me to calm into the red carpet. And this is the magic of breath. It's actually another curious thing, in fact, is that our brain cannot really create stress and focus on the breath at the same time. It's going to have naturally calming effect. So, what happens in life when things don't go really as we expected? Because these things happen too. And it doesn't really say that we need to put our rose-colored glasses and see everything positive and be calm with whatever comes up. It is really important to notice when our state goes out of balance. And there are a few signs that are very important to pay attention to so that we know when we are getting into these kind of situations on the road of life. It is very important to know that we need to pause and stop when we are hungry, angry, lonely, tired or sad. So these are our holds, very important signs. Stress and burnout and often depression happen because when we are hungry we continue we don't stop and I say I'll just write one more proposal and then I will eat and by the time I want to eat I actually am not hungry anymore and then I'm like oh, okay I won't eat if I'm angry I suppress it because it's not okay to be angry when I'm lonely I'm afraid to ask for support I'm afraid to ask people to come and be with me right when I am tired, I say, it just, we have to move on, we have to go on a little bit longer, can't be tired now. And sadness, we often cry alone. So no wonder we hide our depression. But you know, in between these signs, there are beautiful moments, like the moment of discovering the curiosity about your breath. Isn't it amazing? So we need to learn how to observe these signs and not get trapped with monkey mind on what is it really telling us. But at the same time, be ready also to stop and smell the roses. Because there are a lot of them on the way. And in the end of the day, we just need to know how to observe the signs and when is it important for us to pause and stop. And when is it okay for us to speed through life and take it all as much as we can. Thank you.